What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, June 3rd, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, BlackRock's Larry Fink jumps on, quote, next AI trade, warning it'll be a warning the world will be, quote, short power. Oh, he's done a 360 on, or a 180 on this one. Next up, climate crisis versus drill, baby drill. Soros heirs urge Democrats to hammer Trump as convicted felon at every opportunity. Next up, Vermont becomes first state to require oil and gas companies to pay for climate change. Damn it is reparations are here, folks, and we're paying for it. Next mm. up, it's time for a nuclear power renaissance, a great opinion article that we will cover. And then finally, Canada and Ottawa goes the way of Vermont, tries to muzzle oil and gas companies with huge fines for praising their climate efforts. Stu will then toss it over me. I will quickly cover what happened in the last few days in the oil and gas markets. We did see oil prices end the week not very good. We did see the EIA uh, come out um, with, on Thursday, their uh, um, SPR and and uh, crude oil inventory. We'll cover that. Actually, a, a pretty down, you know, a, a big draw relative to what I think we saw in oil prices. Rig counts stay fairly flat. And then we will cover ConocoPhillips buying Marathon Oil. We will cover all that and a bag of chips, folks. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Go ahead and kick us off. Hey, let's start with our buddy over there at uh, BlackRock, Larry Fink. BlackRock's Larry Fink jumps on next AI trade, warning uh, world would be short power. This is absolutely a hoot. Uh, he's the CEO over there. And I'm going to start real quickly. Uh, do you remember in uh, last year, they lost $1.7 trillion in the first half of the year mm -hmm. because of their ESG investments in wind and solar. Now, this comes out to a quote. This is a quote out of the article. I do believe properly mm, build out AI. We're talking about trillions of investing. So data centers could be as much as 200 megahertz. And they're now talking about data centers being one gigawatt. That powers a city, he told the city. The amount of power that's needed to use AI has a huge impact on society. Quote, you need dispatchable power because they can't turn off and on these data centers. Wind and solar is not an option. <laughs> Well, it's the same stuff we said last week. And and in, in my opinion, what this article shows and everyone should take away from this article is that Larry Fink is a capitalist. He is going to let the winds of money dictate what he believes in. When, when, when everybody was money. pouring money into it. ESG, he was all for ESG. Now that everybody has sort of the ship has turned a little bit, we're all talking about AI. We're all talking about the necessary power needed to build out these data centers. Oh, well, guess what? Now he's talking about dispatchable power. You, if you believe anything that comes out of Larry Fink's mouth, do it at your own peril, because I promise you he's only looking out for himself and BlackRock and how they make money. He's right in this case. I agree with him. You need the dispatchable power because these data centers can't just be flipped on and off. We're going to need to build out a grid system that can handle the amount. As we talked about, you can't chat GPT at night because the wind's not blowing. But. What this clearly shows, and everybody right. who's listened to the show knows this, this is just another example of, of Larry Fink doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about whether he, he – he cares about where he believes the money is going to be. And right or wrong, it's his job as he's beholden to the shareholders. So there's maybe a larger conversation to have here about that, but he's just about the money, and that's really all it is. It is. You know, and, and uh, dispatchable power is critical. Uh, let's go to the next one here. Climate crisis dr versus drill, baby, drill. Soros Air urges Democrats to hammer Trump as convicted felon at ever every opportunity. Uh, I'll tell you, when, he, when they talk about this out of this article, uh, repetition is the key to a successful message. And we want people to wrestle with the notion of hiring a convicted felon for the most important job in the country, Soros. Now, remember, Michael, this, the younger Soros, the, the George Soros's son, said he is going to be much more violent or, excuse me, uh, radical than his father was. So where this comes in is uh, that uh, I did my job, Bragg is reporting, that his father got him in there. 
Where this ties into climate change and drill baby drill is watching the next few months, you're going to see a choice between free energy policies, which is drill baby drill, nuclear or wind and solar, or you're going to see the climate narrative lawfare really hammering home and it's going to be funded by the Soros group. That's where that's coming together on this story. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how big of a of a stink both campaigns, both the Biden and the Trump administration make not administration campaigns, what they make, how, how high they rank energy. I mean, right now, there's all this other stuff we're dealing with. We all know, you know, what happened last week with the conviction with the conviction of President Trump, whether or not you agree with it or not. I think the show stands firm. I think it, we think it was a political scam. The real question is, where is that going to is that going to issue going to rank above you know, is that all that's going to be talked about in this, you know, in this election cycle? If that's the case, then it's, a, in my opinion, a distraction from the other critical issues we've got to be right. talking about. One of them you bring up is the difference between whether or not we are going to have free energy versus kind of this, um, you know, right. climate totalitarianism, as we call it. So it'd be interesting to see kind of on the list of items that come up where exactly. whether or not this even shows up. I think it'll be interesting in the debate that they have coming up at the end of June. How big of an issue energy is. I have a I have a feeling it's not going to come up at all because we're going to be dealing with the unfortunate situation that happened last week. So I'm no. a little bit I, I don't believe energy, unfortunately, is going to be that big of a big Ooh. of a campaign I, topic this time I around disagree. because I think people are going to be worried about and these campaigns will be worried about fighting back and forth between quote unquote he's a felon or quote unquote it oh. was a sham. See, that's I, I disagree, and here's why. In my meeting with Senator Ted Cruz last week with the Americans for Prosperity was phenomenal. I mean, it was a powerhouse, and I disagree. Energy, it, uh, energy is life and prosperity. Low cost energy is prosperity. You're, it is on the ballot. So let's go to the next story here because that feeds into this story. Vermont becomes the first state to require oil companies to pay for climate change damages. Michael, I added lawfare as a category on Energy Newsbeat today. I mean, I was like, this is just, we got to start having, we're going to have a whole theory of things that are funded by the Soros family uh, attorneys, lawfare. It is just going to go nuts from here on up. And, and so that's how all this is tying together. Vermont has become the first state to enact a law requiring fossil fuel companies to pay their share of damage caused by climate change after the state suffered catastrophic summer flooding and damage from other extreme weather. Michael, I have a real question here, and I want, I want your opinion on this. Kim Trails, are they real? Or are they weather modification? Weather modification has been going on by the government for years. And call anybody you want. How are you going to prove that it's fossil fuel damage versus chemtrails or weather induced by the government? I just have no clue. If anybody's listening to this, this is this disgusting. Yeah, I mean, I have no, I have, I have no idea. I don't know anything about chemtrails, so I'll, I'm going to leave that up to, uh, to, to you. What, what's going on in Vermont? Well, uh, Republican Governor Phil Scott allowed the bill to become law with a signature late, saying he will be very concerned about the cost and outcome of the small state taking on big oil alone, what will be a grueling legal fight. Quote, I understand the desire to get seek funding to mitigate the effects of climate change that has hurt our state in many ways. How in the world is he going to prove it? The only winners out of lawfare are the attorneys and then the climate narrative. That's it. Yeah, so what they're going to do is they're going to basically, the, the Vermont State Treasurer, along with the Agency <laughs> of Natural Resources within their state, is going to provide a report by beginning of 2026 on the, quote, the total cost that Vermont and the state paid relative to the emissions of greenhouse gases from 1995 all the way to 2024. Odd, there's a weird little two-year gap in there, so I wonder who's going to do that. That assessment will look on the effects of public health, natural resources, agriculture, economic development, 
And then they're going and a bunch and a host of other stuff. Then they're going to use some federal data to determine the amount of covered greenhouse gas emissions attributed to a fossil fuel company. And it's basically a polluter pays model, which says, you know, if, if you've traded or refined or extracted crude oil um, in the or in the in, in the volumes more than a billion metric tons, um, then you're going to be liable to pay. The funny part is there are no oil companies based in Vermont. So what are you going to do? Go after cross states? It. It, it, it gets back to, again, the stuff that you touched on in your speech um, uh, with Ted Cruz, with right. legislation through regulation. This is how it comes down. Exactly. Or regulation through legislation, whatever it's called. Legislation through regulatory action. So it's time now, because of all this, for a nuclear power renaissance. The next story, the Biden administration, I don't get this. The Biden administration announced new steps to bolster the domestic nuclear energy, such as streamlining licensing processes for building new reactors, extending the, the life of existing reactors. Uh, we just had two new ones come online here this past week. Uh, at its peak in the 1990s, the uh, United States had 112 nuclear pan, uh, power plants. Currently, it has 54 power plants in operation. Nearly half of those, the 25, are in the process of being decommissioned. Incredibly, 60 of those being built around the world. Not one is under construction in the U.S. We just had two of them come online uh, in this past bit. So, yeah. I mean, this is great. I'm all we're all for nuclear power absolutely. on this and it doesn't matter, you know, and what what it seems to be is that the way this is going to get movement is bringing back the owner or rolling back the owner's regulations that have been put on the nuclear industry. And as much as I hate to say it, there's got to be some federal funding to get this stuff done. Absolutely. And, and I got to hand it to Senator Cruz again. I hate to keep bringing this up. But he was on it. I mean, like a crow on a June bug when the when the young men from uh, uh, Abilene Christian with their uh, molten salt reactor saying uh, they were being held up by the DOE. Oh, boy, he was on it. Woo, go, go, Senator Cruz. I like it. All so, right. What's next? Let's go to Ottawa. Ottawa tries to muzzle oil and gas companies with huge fines for praising their climate efforts. Uh, companies publicizing their environmental actions will have to prove the truth of every word they say measured against undefined, intentionally recognized methodology. Shut up, oil and gas companies. Don't talk about the environment and emissions gains unless you've made. <laughs> Interesting. So this is... Uh... This is Alberta Minister of Environment and Protected Areas, Rebecca Schultz. Yeah, Bill C-59. Here's the quote. We are looking at every legal option we have available to us, and that does include the Alberta sovereignty within the United Canada Act. There's a co potential constitutional challenge as well. Um, basically, companies publicizing their environmental actions will have to prove the truth of every word they say measured against the really the undefined, quote, internationally recognized methodology. I don't know what that methodology is. I'm sure they'll come up with something on the spot to retroactively make sure these people get a hammer. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. $10 million I've... for the first offense. A second conviction would raise the fine to $15 million. Pretty crazy. I, I tell you what's going to happen is you're going to see some, uh, again, more lawfare from the green. And who's funding the green? A, a host of people. It's not just one. Oh, I know. But, all right. I'm all done. Off to you, dude. Nice. Well, we'll go ahead and and, and cover what happened with, with, with oil and gas over the weekend. But before we do that, guys, as always, thank you for checking out the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Um, all the news and analysis that you just heard is brought to you by that website. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Um, check us out um, in the description below for all the links to the articles, links to the uh, timestamps so you can hop back and forth. Um, we are we, we, we do have some ads rolling at the beginning now, so the timestamps may or may not be off by 30 seconds, so forgive us there. Um, and you're also going to hit all of the links to the articles. Check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. 
I mean, oil ends fairly soft this week, guys. I mean, you know, at, at the end of last week, we saw oil settle above 80. Now we see it settle below 77, 76, 99 as we await for markets to open here. Um, looks to be opening um, a little bit lower. We'll probably see, or excuse me, higher, excuse me. We'll probably see a open above 77 here uh, when markets roll over. Uh, in a bit here on Sunday afternoon, but but right now we're below seventy seven dollars. Um, mainly as we record this here on Sunday afternoon, um, the the OPEC meeting that's going to take place later in the afternoon or daytime, you know, nighttime for us, daytime for them, um, really is going to turn out with is is really going to come with. Okay, now what will OPEC do? Are they just going to keep? extending the production cuts. That's what all the sources are saying right now. Will they add a little bit of a topper, which might end up helping and supporting oil prices? Who knows? We'll see what happens. Um, you know, the other big thing we saw was inflation come in at projections um, or at their projected level, which made overall markets slightly run a little bit. I mean, we saw the S&P 500 actually jump about a full percentage point um, uh you know, day over day on Friday, NASDAQ was at basically flat, but it was down about a percentage point. And then when the inflation data came in, as expected, I mean, people were expecting a higher print than than what it came in. It was a little bit of a interesting, um, interesting narrative around there. But, you know, the big thing for oil prices, again, uh, crude oil currently down 1.8 percentage points. It ended Friday at 76.99. Brent oil, um, 81.74. Natural gas, two dollars and 58 cents. Again, we do expect that numbers as we open here shortly to rise. Um, we did see the EIA come out, and even with on Thursday posting a one point. Go ahead, we can go ahead and pull that image up there. Posting a, um, let me pull it up here. I think it's a like a a 3.7 million barrel draw from this from the uh, crude oil um, uh, commercial reserves. Um, that you know represents one of the larger draws we've seen in a few weeks now, um, and higher than was originally expected. We did see the strategic petroleum reserve add about 500,000 barrels, so a little bit of a build there. Uh, we did see rig counts. We can go and throw the rig count chart up. Basically flat, 600 rigs, that's same week over week. Still about 96 rigs down on a year-over-year -year basis. We saw Canada pick up eight rigs, and internationally we did pick up seven rigs. You know, the only other thing that happened, this was on Thursday, but, I, you know, we were off on Thursday. ConocoPhillips to buy Marathon Oil in $17 billion all-stock deal, which is, again, interesting. Um, ConocoPhillips swoops in buying Marathon Oil, um, which will add about, you know, if you if you go ahead and look at their reserve report, somewhere around two billion barrels um, of recoverable resources. Um, mainly, it's that Eagleford um, and North Dakota uh, position that Marathon has, big Bakken position, big Eagleford crossover position there for Conoco Phillips. What's interesting though is that now Conoco Phillips will be a bigger active player in the Bakken. They don't necessarily have um, too much Bakken assets, um, so it'll be very interesting. To see them entering, um, entering that North Dakota, I mean, it's definitely uh, a little bit different. You know, again, one of the big things they tout is, uh, you know, reduced administration and operating costs of about five hundred million dollars. So, unfortunately, we're you know we know what that means. Layoffs. Conoco Phillips stock was actually down about three point three percentage points. Um, you know, but again, that's because we're talking about an all stock transaction, and again. We're seeing it used to be we saw about six months ago, eight months ago, everything was cash. Now everything's moved into stock because, in my opinion, I think these, the, the, you know, these, these, you know, management teams, you know, in, in, in quote unquote allegiance to the shareholders are key, are wanting to keep the exposure to the stock relative to just cashing out. Again, when oil prices are low, we tend to see cash transitions because people just want to cash out, take their money and run. The real question is, where does the ConocoPhillips stock goes from here? Obviously, they're one of the largest shale producers right now, um, relative to uh, uh, you know their other you know their other competitors, Exxon and Chevron. Obviously, Exxon will become the biggest shale producer once they go ahead and snatch up and make it official for Pioneer. I think they've they've already done that, so I think actually we got to start kind of rephrasing. You know, Exxon Mobil is now the biggest shale producer uh, specifically. Um, you know, my, you know this this valued um, marathon at fourteen point four billion, and they had about two point eight billion um, in outstanding debt. 
Um, ConocoPhillips did come out and say they expect to increase share buybacks worth about $7 billion in the first year and expect, expect to do about $20 billion in the first three years. We're definitely going to do a deal spotlight on this one, so I'll kind of save a lot of my analysis for that. We're still lining up who exactly we want to bring on. But I, I, th I think, you know, every so we've got Conoco, Exxon, Chevron, all have made deals. The real question is, What's next now? Is it, you know, right. there are rumblings that we double eagle is going to be selling again. This, you know, double eagle four, they could be valued somewhere about six point four billion dollars. I've heard citizen energy rumor on the street is they put themselves up for sale. Uh, you know, uh, if if you're a deal spotlight listener, um, we did see some of the stuff that uh came from um excuse me, that did come from um the deal spotlight that I recorded with John Farrell. There could be a possibility Grayson Mill is up for sale. That's another Bakken player. So I think there's a few names, but I think the in terms of what the big companies are doing, I think you know that's going to wind down, and I think it's going to be a lot more mergers. Now I think we've seen the acquisition phase go through. It could be a lot more e uh, mergers of equals, which is going to be super interesting. Um, but that's really all I've got, Stu. Anything else people should worry about coming up this week? Um, I'll tell you, just uh, buckle up and get ready for some serious entertainment in the next 30 to 60 days. Yeah, it's it's going to get crazier as, as we move closer, especially as we move into election season, guys. It's going to, again, as we talked about, it's going to be interesting to see how energy decides to play itself out during this. But we will make sure you stay up to speed with everything you need to know um, on that. But uh, with that, guys, we're going to let you get out of here. Start your Monday. We appreciate you checking us out here on the world's greatest podcast, Energy Usby Podcast for Stuart Trillan. Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.